I think that if there's any uh, criticism of our church is that we allow the wrong people right. to define us. We have a story. We have a presence. And we've produced some of the greatest preachers, some of the greatest orators, some of the greatest evangelists in the world. And among those great productions is your jurisdictional prelate, Bishop Houston. I don't love you, Bishop Houston. to the College of Bishops and in, and in every elevation when you're elevated what happens to you is you literally start over. Yep. I was a master first assistant uh, and to my bishop, the Bishop Leroy Jackson Woolen in Greater North Carolina. Uh, I was his financier and I was his first assistant and I knew that job well. And uh, I've become a veteran at it. I've been in a Greater North Carolina for 25 years. But when I was made bishop, uh, once you get elevated, you start over. So now, going into the chamber, I'm a rookie. I'm as green as green can be. <laughs> and to be honest with, with you, I'm still green and learning and watching. But while in there, I got a chance and I get the chance to see a, a true elder statesman at work, a father, a man of God who knows the Lord. And he hadn't just got to know the Lord, but he's God's man. And when, no matter what goes on in the chamber, there is always a, a space saved for him that he will lead us to the throne of grace, a godly man, and I love and honor tonight Bishop Harvey Lewis. Yeah. Thank God for him and thank God for the bishop's administrative staff, all of these fine superintendents, and thank God for uh, uh, Pastor Shepherd. We certainly do appreciate God for him and and for your acting Supervisor, Supervisor Singleton, we certainly do honor you tonight, amen, and uh, to all of the women of God, and especially to your jurisdictional first lady, amen. She's a beautiful lady, and I enjoy watching her and her husband interact. They love each other. Amen. You'd be surprised, and perhaps not, the places where people who seem to be on fire for the Lord, husbands and wives, but there's a total disconnect. Amen. Amen. When he's having words, she's mad. Rock. He's preaching, she got rocks in her jaws. Something wrong with that. Uh, First Lady Thurston. That looks at her husband when he's ministering, uh, like a woman looks at a man when she just met him and they just got married. And her eyes get all dreamy. And, and, and you, know, you know what I know? When he's up ministering, she giggles a lot. That's a sign. Amen. Amen. Most women love a man who can make them laugh. And he uh, makes her. Laugh. Isn't that refreshing? Yes. Isn't that yes. wonderful to see? You know, a, a, an applause go in there. Yes. We've been traveling and, and doing, and we're going to go to the Word, but I want to acknowledge someone here tonight who is, uh, thank you, sir, very special. When I was uh, appointed to North Carolina Third, as I forementioned, I was serving as first assistant in Greater North Carolina. My bishop, Bishop Leroy Jackson Willard, is a man of God in the A godly man, a man bathed in prayer. And it was an honor to serve him. I was drafted by the uh, 
presidium of our church, Bishop Daniels, contacted me. I later received a letter from the presiding bishop and was asked to go and to uh, just be interim. Um, and later on, they changed my assignment and gave me a, appointed me there for a year. And then they said after a year they would revisit the jurisdiction and, and, and see what happens. And uh, they would either give it to someone else or some of the elders could run or I could possibly become prelate. The brethren, after two months, asked the presiding bishop, they said, we don't want to wait a year. Uh, we would like to uh, have a vote. And the Lord bless me, I received 100% of the vote. And, uh, but when I was selected, I needed help. And I needed a strong man, a godly man. I didn't, I wasn't familiar, I didn't know most of the brethren in North Carolina III. Uh, the jurisdiction had just been ratified. God has blessed us, we have about 50 churches. We're in North Carolina, we're in South Carolina, and we're in Virginia. And the Lord is adding and blessing. And there were administrative assistants already in place. So I didn't want to, on my first day, come in moving everybody. That's not necessarily the best way to start. Uh, but I didn't know who I could trust, who I could talk to. And uh, a man of God, whom I knew and that I loved, and he told me uh, that he had served in our church and the Lord had led him uh, to South Carolina and the Lord has blessed them to build a mighty ministry down there and to have a mighty following. But he said if you God ever elevates you uh, to prelate, I'm coming and I'm going to serve. And I called him. And uh, he said I will do it. And I came in, I left everybody in place and made him the chief of staff. Because uh, now I have a man whom I can trust and a man who has the weight in terms of the glory, in terms of accomplishments. See, uh, a, a light person, you don't have anything that speaks to your greatness uh, but your words, then it's hard to get people to follow. That has to be something behind that evidence has to be weak and this man has it and took out time tonight to fly up here at his own expense just to be with me tonight our convocation starts next week next Wednesday, Thursday and Friday and uh, I want to thank God for Chief of Staff the Superintendent of the South Carolina District we have about since he's been appointed Superintendent we have about nine churches in South Carolina. And how about this? Not one of those churches, not one, not one, uh, were Church of God in Christ. We have an awesome prelate in North Carolina, in South Carolina, the Bishop Johnny Johnson, a man whom I respect and revere. And I think it's time out uh, for us stealing from each other. But that's not real growth. See. You get his members and he gets yours. You're all just swapping folks. And all that's going to do is create a problem and pastors are going to fall out. And I'll tell you pastors, members aren't worth falling out of. Because after they get you two to fall out, they go join the third person. This man through his leadership, the Lord has blessed us, and we're growing in the state of South Carolina, and it's real growth. I thank God for my chief of staff, Superintendent Tommy Eugene Quick. Would you give him a big hand? Awesome man. Awesome man. I thank you, sir, for coming. He said to me, when I told him that I was coming and who I was coming for, he said, Bishop, I just feel that I should be there when you uh, go to the chairman 
of the General Assembly's church. And I told him, thank you. Thank God for my full-time minister of music. He's been with me now about 24 years. He saved a uh, married to a woman, a husband of one wife, four kids, and have put them all through college. And amen. Serving in the church. God bless Elder Clarence Crayford. He is our traditional minister of music. And my wife sends her greetings tonight. Mother, she uh, probably had I left home and came straight here. She may have come with us. Two minute stops and she had the grandbabies. And you know how that is. But uh, uh, I'm ready to get back home now. I, I miss her. And uh, we have a 6 a.m. flight, so you know I'm trying to get back to Raleigh. Say amen. And uh, the Lord bless us. Um, in uh, December the 6th, we will have, we will celebrate 39 years of marriage. And I, I thank the Lord for that. I want to call your attention to the word of the Lord tonight. The second Timothy chapter 3. And I want to read in your hearing verse 10, verses 10 through 17. Amen. Second Timothy, the third chapter, the 10th through the 17th verse. And I think that when people put their expertise to work and make things work for you, y'all technology, uh, the sound made awesome. Super job. God bless you. Amen. Super, super kept my little broken voice. Verse 10, if you haven't, say, I have it. I have it. says, uh, 2 Timothy 3 and 10, but thou hast fully, Paul talking to Timothy here, known my doctrine, manner of life, the why of my life, my purpose, my why that which um, motivates me, my purpose, my belief, my faith, my long suffering, the things that I've been able to endure, my love and my patience, my perseverance, persecutions and afflictions which came to me at Antioch you know, it was at Antioch that Paul gave one of the most powerful history lessons. And uh, souls were saved, but they expelled them from Antioch. At Iconium, and you know, at Iconium, he went there and preached, and people got saved, but folk then turned the people against him. And at Lystra, at Lystra, he healed the man by the power of Christ who was impotent in his feet. And the people began to deify Paul and Barnabas and call them a Jupiter, Junus, and Mercury. And Paul stopped that deification. And then the people turned on him and stoned him and left him for dead. He said, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all. Timothy, just as it happened to me, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. In the meanwhile, but evil men and seducers, evil men and swindlers evil men and imposters shall go from bad to worse. Shall wax worse and worse. Deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been 
assured of. Stay in those fixed truths that you know. Knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. For doctrine. For doctrine. For reproof. For correction. For instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. In verse 10, the first clause, he says, but thou hast fully known my doctrine. Um, the 16th verse, he says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. And that's what I want to preach to you tonight about. I want to preach about doctrine. Right, on this subject, doctrine. Everybody say doctrine. doctrine. Bless us, Lord. May we do no damage to your word, but preach that which becometh sound doctrine and gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Say it with me once more, doctrine. doctrine. The uh, Greek word for this word doctrine is didaskalia, didaskalia. Didaskalia is that which belongs to the didaskalos. And the didaskalos is the teacher. The didaskalia is that which is taught. I want you to hear me tonight. Very important. That which is taught. Instructions. Simply put, that which is taught. Now, I'm not speaking of teaching opposed to teaching. But what I am speaking of, of us knowing what we believe. Right. It has been determined that all of the world's religions, that Christians are the least knowledgeable of their religion. Muslims know what they believe as false as it is. The Jehovah's Witness know their script as false as it is. Oh my, these gurus and yoga people, all that, the Eastern mysticisms and people know what they believe. Most Christians don't know why they are Christians. Amen. I teach a 8 a.m. minister's class. I've been teaching this class now for about 21 years or so. And uh, in our class, we do not teach preachers how to preach in terms of livery, um, in terms of uh, style and uh, uh, delivery. We spend more time in teaching content and how to see the world through biblically uh, shaded lenses and how to uh, approach the world with a thus saith the Lord. Uh, we get approximately for that 8 a.m. early morning class, 
anywhere from 150 to 200 come out for the class. There's no charge. And the only thing that I won't allow them to do in the class is to tape it. Your, 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 your charge, your tuition is you got to get up and come. I'll be there to teach you, and you've got to come. And one of the things that we specialize in is uh, making sure that without any emotion, uh, without any um, uh, jubilation, the phrase I use is to be able to sit on your hands and without speaking in tongues, explain how you know that you're saved and know what you believe. It is vital, pray with me, that we know what we believe. It is a scare. The Scalia uh, refers also to the authority of the teacher. Not simply the subject taught, but also the act of instructing the saints. Your leader is a man filled with the word of God. I would have never known that he had any kind of speech impediment for he is known everywhere for his mastery of the human language. Yes, yes. Uh, and, the, and how the other day uh, uh, he began to speak a little Spanish in the General Assembly. And I said, Lord, there's no limits to this man. Then I come here tonight and learn that uh, he had a speech impediment. Well, he certainly got over that. And he does a tremendous job of teaching the Word of God. Amen. If there is any place where we seem to have lost our way as members of the body of Christ, seems to me it's in the area of what we believe. And not only in the area of what we believe and what we teach, but we seem to struggle with our ability to say what we believe. Man, perhaps that's why so few Christians witness now. Very few of us share the faith. Most Christians don't feel the need to share the faith. One survey showed that less than 5% of the members of the body of Christ share the faith. And by the way, inviting someone to the convocation is not sharing the faith. Inviting someone to your church did not share yeah. the faith. Telling people about what Jesus did on the cross yeah. Yeah. is sharing the faith. Yeah. And then sharing your testimony yeah. is telling what has happened to you yeah. as a result of what Jesus did yeah. on the cross. Yeah. And yet very few of us today share the faith. Yeah. Are you praying for me? What we believe is essential to our very existence. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Not only what we believe, but how we communicate what we believe. Peter said this in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 16. He says, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables. He says, we have not followed uh, cleverly made up stories when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, when we told you the story of how Christ came to this earth, we didn't make it up. He says, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. It says, this voice came and says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And you know that happened twice in Jesus' 
earthly ministry. At the baptism of John, God the Father spoke and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then on the Mount of Transfiguration, God spoke when Peter suggested that we build three tabernacles. One for Elijah, one for Moses, and one for thee. I'm really glad they didn't do that. Can you imagine the mess we would have today had they built three houses of worship to three, uh, all three of them would be fighting like cats and dogs. Some would be saying, I'm of Elijah. Right. Right. Somebody else, I'm of Moses. Right. And someone else, I'm of Jesus. And God spoke and said, shut up, Peter. This is my beloved son. In whom I am well pleased, hear ye him. He says, uh, this voice, verse 18, and this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. He says here, we have also, listen to this, a more sure word of prophecy. We have a complete and reliable a fixed word of prophecy we have a fixed word of foretelling yeah. whereunto you do well to take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawns and the day star appear the world is that dark place the preaching of the gospel under the anointing of God is the light that shines in the dark place. And Peter says, knowing this first, that no prophecy, that is no telling forth of the word of God, no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. It is not of anyone's own explanation. And we have a lot of that now. Preachers today uh, do not preach the word of God as we all in context. We use too much our sanctified imaginations. Many preachers today are lazy. And they don't put the time in to study and to prepare. And in many cases, erroneous things are being said from the pulpit. I heard a preacher say one time that he got his sermons on the way to his church at the stop line. And then I understood why there was no weight to his word because he spent no time with the Lord. I want to say to the preachers in this jurisdiction, spend time before God. People need the word of God. The world is turning against the Lord. The world has the media. The world has the sports. The world has entertainment. The world has all of these things. The world has infiltrated itself into our public school systems. The world, there are so many disciplines and doctrines being thrown at our children that is antithetical to what we preach. And then in many cases, in many cases, many churches now, those that do have youth church, they spend their youth church time letting the children use coloring books and playing games rather than learning the doctrine. In our youth departments, the doctrine of Jesus Christ, the teachings of the Bible are not being emphasized. But no preaching of the gospel is of anyone's private explanation. For the prophets came not, the prophecy came not in the old time of the about the will of men, but holy men of God spake, they preached as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And when the Holy Ghost is moving you, the Holy Ghost moves us to preach the truth. To say what God says and to say it contextually. You know, a good example of uh, the, God, the word of God being taken out of context uh, is these fads that seem to sweep through the body of Christ. One that immediately comes to mind, do you remember the fad that swept through where, where everybody was saying to the Lord, the, the Bible says, command ye me. And, and men began to preach from pulpits 
And people began to command God and command God. And, and they never studied the context of what was said in Isaiah. What the Lord actually was doing was he was rebuking Israel for trying to command him. The truth is God told them, I'm going to raise up a wicked man, Cyrus. And God called Cyrus his servant. And he says, I'm going to use Cyrus, my servant, to chasten you. And they got upset with God because God says, I'm going to use this Chaldean. And uh, the argument was, can the thing that is being made say to its maker, what make is thou? Can the child that is being born say to his mother, what gives it, when the mother gives him birth, what have you brought forth? And then God says, look, let argue with human beings, but you can't command me. But, but, so when you put it in its context, we're not to command God. But if you lift it out of its context, people began to command God and tell God what to do. And I got a question for you. How did that work out? How many times did God jump? God who made everything. Just because you stood there and said, God, I command you. I'm glad God has a sense of humor. Puny human beings trying to command him. The unlimited trying to command the, un the unlimited. Praise the Lord. That makes no sense. But when the word is not preached in context, we go the wrong way. And things began to be allowed in our church that ought not to be allowed. Are you going to pray for me tonight? Follow me for just a few more minutes. The Apostle Peter also said this in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. He says, but sanctify the Lord God in your heart and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you the reason for the hope that is in you. First of all, let us sanctify Jesus in our hearts. Bishop, uh, I, I have, have done this for years in our local church, and, and sometimes it trips up our guests, but uh, I don't allow idolatry to be a part of our worship. Oftentimes in our settings, we will uh, say we give honor to the Lord, and you might hear that. Then we give honor to the pastor. And oh, everybody going to cheering and screaming and hollering. And I said, I can't allow this. I'm not God. I'm just a human being. So I instruct the saints that there ought to be a different body. That there ought to be a major distinction uh, when I, the Lord is recognized and when I'm recognized. So sometimes when our guests come, they say, well, you all didn't make enough noise. Celebrate your leader. And, but the saints know that they can't go but so high. Because the, 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 the star in the church is God. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and he's the one that we've got to sanctify in our hearts. And let me tell you this. And let me tell you this, in sanctifying the Lord in your heart, you got to make sure that you don't confuse religion and church work with sanctifying the Lord in your heart. Some preachers now know they don't study the Bible anymore until they're studying to preach. That is not sanctifying the Lord in your heart. God is saying, make time for me. Have a special place for me in your heart. Good God Almighty. You know how it was when you first got saved. You didn't need an organ. You didn't need a praise team. You didn't need all these things that we have to have now to get a response because he was sanctified in our heart. But over time, we went from being Mary's to Martha's. And we got encumbered with a whole lot of other stuff. And we forgot all about the love of God. I thank God for this hardware that I wear around my neck. But it is not my God. It is not where my joy comes from. It is not what keeps me in the church. What keeps me going. Praise the Lord. What life 
Christ my father yeah. is that the God of the Bible yeah. is sanctified in my heart. There's a place in me that belongs to him that no one else can have. Every one of us, every one of us, every man in here, every woman, you've got to keep that. And, and listen, that's missing in our church. There is, you won't like me tonight, but there is a deadness. There is a lack of lust. There is a lack of a daisical a spirit in our church. There is a deadness across the body of Christ. Many of us have lost our fight. We are professional churchmen. We are professional church women. We know how to be bishop. We know how to be supervisors. We know how to be pastors and superintendents and elders and all of the other titles. But do, do we still have Jesus sanctified? Amen. Amen. In our hearts. Right. Does we still uh, bring a tear uh, to your eyes? And does the joy still hit you just walking down the hallway in your house? When you think on the goodness of the Lord. That's the requirement number one. Keep the Lord sanctified. If you keep Jesus sanctified in your heart, it'll keep you saved. It'll keep you when service is over. You'll go home. You'll do the right thing. When Christ is sanctified in your heart, it sanctifies your action. It causes you to give up things. Amen. And it keeps you out of trouble. It keeps your reputation right. Amen. Your wife can trust you. Your husband can trust you. Praise the Lord. Because Christ is sanctified in your heart. He says, sanctify the Lord in your heart and, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you not, not what is your hope. That's but it. what is the reason That's it. for your hope? That's it. You say you believe that Jesus is coming back? Right. Yes, Explain to me right. why you believe that. Right. Praise the Lord. Where did you get that from? Yeah. Where did you read that? Yeah. See, I don't want to know your hope. I, the world wants to know the reason for your hope. Yeah. And he says no matter who you meet, That's it. That's they can be church people or not. Come on. Be ready. Yeah. Always. In here, if I say, I went to a meeting one night, and my heart wasn't right, but something got a hold of me, you understand me. But there are people who don't understand me. They don't even know what you mean when you say you went to the meeting. And what does got a hold of you mean? And when, well, who is or what is something? In that case, every one of us have to be ready, whether they're black or white. Praise the Lord. Whether they are rich or poor. Praise the Lord. I remember in college, a Muslim came up to me one day. And, uh, you know, uh, sometimes the Muslims try to intimidate. And he came up to me and he talked about the honorable Elijah Muhammad and using all that bolster. And I looked at him and I said, look, man, uh, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't as polished. I said, look, man, look. I'm ready to die for what I believe. Do you believe yours like that? Because if you don't, you need to go on and take that stuff to somebody else. No, he did. He left me alone. And what he ran into was somebody who truly believed. He was accustomed to Christians buckling. I had to stroll in there. Jehovah's Witness. Um, this guy was watching me, you know. Every time I looked up, the guy was looking at me. Now, you know what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why you're looking at me. I'm in a restaurant. Why are you looking at me? And I, I didn't like it. So I'm watching this guy. He's looking at me. And so then finally, I guess he was sizing me up. And uh, he was going to bring me watchtower uh, material, uh, society material. And I said, sir, let me tell you something. I am the self-proclaimed tip of the spear, for I believe the God of the Bible. I do too. And I said, I am not convertible. You can't mm -hmm. win. <laughs> then I begin to share with him hey, articles of our faith. Yeah. Not only that, 
I began to show him the error of his way. Guess what he did? He left you alone. He left me alone. I said, no, sir. No. And you never know when the opportunity will present itself. Be ready at all times to give an answer. Answer that to give a defense. Because Christianity is being attacked. Carlton Pearson and this uh, this wicked, godless, idiotic uh, <laughs> universalism is making inroads into our church. And, and the thing, thing that bothers me about that, and I'm going to preach this, man, I'm feeling better here, uh, is the idiocy of his doctrine. If you follow his teachings and what he believes to its logical conclusion, if the devil is going to be saved, if everybody's going to end up saved, if we're all going to be saved, then uh, Carlton, what do we need you for? Why would I join your church? Why would I pay time? Why would I give up? Why would I participate in any of this? What's the point of preaching if everybody's going to be saved anyway? That's a heresy. And when these people come, we've got to be able to flat-footed give a response that shuts that stuff down. And I pray that any, and they got me out there on social media, I pray that any artist, any singer, any artist that connects with that wickedness, I pray that churches not bring them in. Because you ought not to be able to join a cult and then come in this holy place and sing to the saints of God. It ought not to be. I see in a time when if you say something like that, what I just said in holiness, y'all would be screaming. But it ought not to be. How are you going to do that and still be uh, welcomed in the brotherhood? And we put you up the same. To me, you can't sing and not. That important. Praise the Lord. I want to know what you believe. My battery's trying to go. And the people are going to try to mix the faith. Sorry, y'all. That, 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 that can't be a lot better. Artist one time to come down to church, and we invited her, and the girl got up and sang, and she she kind of she lost it. She began to argue with the people, and she began to tell folks, "Don't y'all look at me like that." She couldn't remember her lyrics. She, she, really, she really went bad. And we found out after service, uh, she had begun to date a Muslim. And she was fasting to Ramadan. And then tell I'm so glad that the anointing in our church was so strong that the anointing shut her down. It would have been bad for you to be able to be fight, fasting to a false god right. and, and then have the upper room members running around the wall screaming and happy and hollering and happy off your singing. Right. That means that we would have had no discernment whatsoever. Right. And God knows that there's ever been a time where the believers need discernment. The time is now. We are being given the not so subtle message today that everything and anything goes. And I won't look in your bedroom one day. Don't you look in mine. But let me tell you something. We still serve a God of standards. And this is a holiness church. And in holiness, we are called, praise the Lord, to a higher standard of living. The portable charge is trying oh, yeah. to die. <laughs> you got to be ready to give a defense. You got to be ready. But we can't defend because what we're hearing now more and more and more from our preachers is less That's right. and less and less. We don't have service like we used to. I don't think that it happens here, but many churches have given up on Sunday night. Praise the Lord. We got to be out now. We act like Baptists. We got to be out by one. The Holy Spirit is having its way. The people, we got to go. And, uh, and when it comes to God, everything is speeding up. In case my battery goes preachers out. now are, are reporting you know the secular psychiatrists who have told us I have that people sitting next to me that don't tag me if my battery dies minutes. then but you know what? go with her, they, they didn't Marie Stevenson, Wiley. They didn't tell the NFL, they haven't told the NBA. 
Praise God, you go to the movies, the average movie is still two hours. And you know what people do? They sit right there. Bag of Marie Stevenson Wiley, she's sitting right and next to me. When it comes to God, she's live. Okay, mine goes out. I told her to tag me in her life. work on this thing until it becomes second nature. We've got to work on the scriptures until church is no longer something that we do, but it becomes who we are. This is what the Lord has called us to do. Amen. We've got to be ready for the wiles of the devil. I want you to know that you're being studied. You're being watched. Every one of us in here, we're being studied According to the scripture, you're being watched, you're being measured, you're being sized up. This is why you need to spend time before God. The Bible teaches in Ephesians 6 and 11, put on the whole arm of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Word wiles uh, gives, it comes from the, the Greek word methodia, which gives us our English word method. And wiles is the systematic and orderly handling of a subject. Right. Have you ever gone through and you felt like, my God, everything is going wrong, and this happened, and then that happened, and then the other, and then you ask, now what else could go wrong? And then something else goes wrong? Well, that's when that's when you're going through an evil day. You're going through a time of attack. And that time doesn't just happen uh, haphazardly. The devil studies you, and then he waits to when he thinks the time is right. And then he comes, and sometimes he hits you with trial A, and then if that doesn't work, he comes with trial B, and if that doesn't work, he comes with trial C, and then if they don't work, he'll come back with A, B, C, D, and bring them all at the same time. And sometimes you wonder, God, is that somebody up there working against me? No, it's not someone up there working against you. It's the devil working against us. He studies us. And one of the reasons the church is losing ground, and many of our churches are, is because while the enemy is studying us, we are not studying the doctrine. We are not studying the scripture. We are not studying, spending the necessary time before God to be able to withstand against the wiles of the devil. You don't know what the Lord has for you in your future. Daniel uh, made a decision between the ages of 17 and 18. Having been taken captive, he was an exile some 900 miles from home. Praise the Lord. No cell phone. No video. No way for the word to get back to his parents. When he was taken, Jerusalem had been besieged. When he was taken, Jehoiakim had gone down. His memories of his beloved Jerusalem was a city in ruins. Now here he is, a little Mandari, a Hebrew boy in a strange land, Babylonian. Praise the Lord. Everything he saw was foreign to him. And yet, this teenager yeah. made a decision. Yeah. Hey. Bible says he purposed Woo. in his heart oh, hey. that he would not defile hey. himself hey. with the king's meat. Yeah. Hey. And not only did he do that, but he found three buddies yeah. and got them to go along with him. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Right. Better yeah. known Shake by that. their given wicked name. Right. Shadrach, right. Meshach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those men, because they decided not to defile themselves, they received a special anointing. Yeah. Oh, yes, they did. Because God needed it. Now, hear me now. That's why you got to spend time before God. Because you don't know what's in your future. God needed that two years later, Pharaoh would have a dream. That God would give him a dream, and the dream would disturb him. And that Pharaoh would call for his magicians and his sorcerers and his enchanters 
and say, I've dreamed a dream. And this dream has disturbed me. He says, and I need you to give me the interpretation of the dream. They said to him, well, tell us what you dream. He said to them, I don't remember what I dream. But I need you to tell me what I dream. And interpret the dream. They said, King, King, we, we can't do that. I mean, the, the way it works, you tell us the dream. And we interpret the dream. He said, that's the way it's been working. But I'll tell you what, if you don't tell me what I dream and interpret my dream, I'm going to kill all of you. They decided that they would include Daniel and the Hebrew boys also. And they went to Daniel, but because of a decision that Daniel had made two years prior, he was in a place with God. Well, he could not only interpret the dream, but tell the king what he dreamed. You don't know what the Lord has in store for you. But I tell you what, when it happens, you've got to be ready. When it happens, you've got to be in a place where you can take advantage of what the Lord has for you. And sometimes you don't see it coming. You don't see it coming. I just told you. I was serving where I was. I had no idea that anybody would consider me to be a part of uh, NC Third, and I didn't like. I didn't want the jurisdiction. I was happy where I was, but when the time came, my anointing was in place. I didn't have to go get saved. I didn't have to go and get anybody to forgive me. The anointing was in place. Let me tell you prophetically: God has things for you, but you've got to be ready. Isn't it amazing the number of women who want a Boaz, but they don't want to be a Ruth? Isn't it amazing the number of people who want to conquer Goliath, but they don't want to be a David? That is a time of preparation. There's a time when you got to spend time, praise the Lord, getting close to the Lord. So when the devil comes against you, you'll be ready to stand against him. A preacher friend of mine told me uh, of a of a demon that came to him and said to him, I have been assigned to you and I have been following you all of your life and my assignment is to kill you. A white brother, he said, he said, and preacher, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have thought anything of it. He said, but, but I almost got drowned when I was four years old. He said, that demon brought that up. He said, I was there then. And I tried to kill you, but uh, the Lord uh, saved you. And then he talked about other things that had happened that that spirit could not know, except that that devil was there. But the good thing is, the Lord was there every step of the way. And I'm going to tell you that the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him to deliver them. And I'm praying that everybody would seek the Lord as never before because we've got to know what we believe. We get our, our beliefs from the Word of God. And we've got to articulate those beliefs. Why do you say we're confused? We're confused on simple things. Look at what has happened to our church. We don't even get definitive voices, a right. uh, definitive voice on a regular basis about black and white sin. Right. We have homosexuals and lesbians oh. running around. Uh, <laughs> we got people who are messed up like that, and these people take pictures and cameos with all of our leaders. Right. This is all right. I mean, so, Camera has it. A young man walked up to me dressed like a woman with a, uh, uh, his, his, his coat. The coat was the color of your dress. Was cut off midway. Had on tight gray pants and a coat like yours. He walked up to me and said, I love Bishop Patrick L. Wood. Can I take a picture with you, Bishop? I said, you most certainly may not. If you don't take a picture with me, you need to dress like a man. You don't wear that stuff. Uh, I love it. I said, but I got to tell the truth. Man. Uh, I'm not, you're not going to have me on Facebook. Right. Said, right. I'm a no side. Amen. Some of us don't say that. Have a break. Right.
right, I know. No, I know. So <laughs> you will That's right. That's right. He's telling the truth. You look like a man. I said, no, sir. So I said, go and dress like a man. And if you come back, I'll take a picture. And so the next national meeting, he came up to me and he was a little better. He had on a brown suit and said, Bishop, can I take a picture? The Holy Ghost said, don't do it. I said, no. Talk first. The Lord going to do something in you. Lord, I'm getting witness to him. And the next night I saw him and he had on the black pants, uh, it looked like cool locks. <laughs> <laughs> and we got, uh, what you call those things? Capri. We got dressed like a girl. I was so like, hey, man, come, 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 come here. I see, that's why I didn't take the picture with you. And he said, well, Bishop, I love fashion. I said, but that's not fashion. No. You are a man. Yeah. You will make somebody a good husband. Yeah. You, God has a destiny. You, you God will make you a dad. You ain't going to become no father. <laughs> they don't get fathers. <laughs> they don't get children from that lifestyle. You will, God wants you to be a father. And, uh, and, and so I told him. And, and, but the problem is, the problem is, not enough of us say things. Uh, we pretend for I, I, I'm leaving, I'm leaving Kansas City. Kansas. Because y'all won't say amen. amen we I'll we tell pretend, it. we I'll pretend I that we don't notice this stuff. That's right. And I told the national team, I tell you, y'all need Oscars. Because we have become great pretenders. We act like we don't notice that director. We act like we don't notice that preacher. And while we are pretending not to notice, our sons and daughters are being turned out. Left and right. It's hard now to attend one of our church services. And some man is not standing up and showing all kinds of signs of effeminate and, and, and homosexuality and it's just a shame because we were once mighty men warriors mandingo men right where it is men, right we right in this country we mocked the civil rights we pulled against poor Christmas dog and I look at us we got our pants hanging off our rear ends yeah. we're putting earrings in our ears that you 
are a lost traveler in search of the light. And I'm here to tell you, I am not lost. I was lost, but in 1977, around about 2.15 on a Sunday afternoon in the month of November, I saw the light. God Almighty Jesus came into my heart and set my spirit free. And from that day to this day, good God Almighty, I have not walked in darkness. Now we're trying to bring these things. Saints flashing uh, signs of Greek life. All this stuff. There's no cross in that. You can't find Christ in that. In the book of Pergamos, he called all, in the book of Ephesians, at the church of Pergamos, he called the saints out of even out of the, the gills. Because each gill had its own God. But the gills were sort of like unions. And if you were not a part of a guild, you couldn't sell your wares. You couldn't do your business. And yet Jesus said, come out of the gills. Because you can't swear your allegiance to anybody but me. And the last time I heard in the Christian doctrine, you can't serve God and man. No man can serve two masters. Right. You will hate one and love, love the other. You cling to one and despise the other. other. But you can't serve God and man. I wonder, do I have anybody in here tonight who has just come out since the Lord saved you? You dropped all of that stuff. And you have decided for God I'll live and for God I'll Let me hear you say amen. Let me see you wave your hand. Thank God for the light. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And you know there's no room for Eastern stars. But the star on the Eastern star is a pentagram. It's the star of Satan. It's the same star that is used to worship Satan. How are we going to have folk? in an organization with a star that worships Satan, meeting and praise and worship in the sanctified church, going all against our doctrine. When these things happen, it reminds me of what they did with Solomon's temple. By the time Nebuchadnezzar burned Solomon's temple, the glory had been departed because they allowed in the temple different altars to different gods. And when you would go in that beautiful place that Solomon had built, she saw an idol to Molin, an idol to Astaroth, the Asherah poles were put up, all kinds of the diversity. They became tolerant, and everything was going on, and the glory of God left. And I'm here to tell you that God has called us a holy He didn't call us to be a church that keeps on changing. He didn't call us to be a church that goes with every wind, every doctrine, every whim. I believe that if we stand our ground, I believe that if we keep the crosses in the church, if we keep the lights, good God Almighty, I like this church. I'm glad there's no disco light in this time. I'm glad there's no fog machines in the church. We don't need any of that stuff. All we need is the Holy Ghost. All we need is sincere heart. Somebody say it. Yeah. 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 Lift your hands and praise the Lord. We're confused. We're confused. Even when it comes to the wickedness of abortion. I preach about it because I believe that black folk deserve better. I believe that all people deserve better. I want you to know that since 1973, 46% of black 
folk who should be here are missing due to abortion. And by the way, there's somebody here who has had an abortion and you've repented of your sins. The Lord has forgiven you. Don't lose your joy. Don't get your grip and go home. Jesus has forgiven you like he's forgiven everyone else. But you gotta try to let us save the next baby because a slaughter is going on. 900 black babies are being aborted in America every day. 900 every day. We went from being the largest minority group in America. We lost that. Have you ever wondered why the Hispanics in no time at all have become 17, 18, and 20 percent of the American population and we hover between 11 and 13 percent? We can never get any higher than that. The numbers show that it's the sin of abortion. It is offering our children to the God of Molech. And the sad thing is, our preachers don't preach about it. The sad thing is, our supervisors don't talk about it. The sad thing is, our leaders don't talk about it as we are. But I'm telling you that this too is part of our doctrine. I feel you're pulling on me, but let me preach anyhow. Why do you think it's protected? 
They are powerful people in elected positions who worship Satan, who gets these body parts and these pieces. Then there are other powerful people who are trying through the placenta and through the blood, trying to find the fountain of youth. It'll never happen. They want to live forever. And they're trying to build this on the backs of children. And the founder of Planned Parenthood, yeah. Margaret Sanger, yeah. said we cannot let the word get out that the purpose of Planned Parenthood is the extermination of the Negro race. Yeah. And if any of the Negroes find out and seem to get out of line, guess what she said? Their own ministers will deal with them. And that is exactly it. That's right. You hear all the time. Man, you shouldn't say this. You can't say that. Man. If you can't say the truth, what's the point of being a Well, if you say this, if you say that, you won't move up. But what's up? What is up? I think up in God. Up in God is obeying God. That's not. Because at the end of the day, the only thing that's going to matter. When we stand before him, yep. whether or not we yep. get what he said. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah. And you know what? Most people, let me, since I've already messed up, most people, most men fight to save their own. Well, what's wrong with you? What are you, we preach about haters. Well, yeah. And we're telling everybody's got a limb. And you know, we go on and we try to find out whatever it is Jake's them talking about. We try to work that in. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, I'm dead serious. Uh, and y'all got me? Yeah, go on. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And, 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 and these defining issues, well, we don't preach about it. Well, well. Read your mind. None of the prophets ignore right. the defining issues of their day. No, 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 and one of the first things that God told Israel, he said, there is a practice going on in the land of Canaan. Well, so they, they let their children pass through the fire to the God Molech. Right. Now, 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 that, this red carpet right here in the middle, yeah. pretend that this is a trough. Well, pretend that that door at the back is the image of a false god, Molech. Mm. The trough would be set on fire. Molech is the god of convenience. He is the god, cannot god, false god now, of favors. To get favor from Molech, to get convenient weather for the crops, to get rid, to get rid of the problem so you can still stay in college, to do whatever they need to do to get rid of the nuisance. They would offer their child to Molly. Yeah. And let me tell you how they would do it. Dad would get on one side, mm. mom would get on the other. Dad would hold one hand, mom would hold the other. Mm. They would light the trunk and they would begin to walk. The parents didn't get in the trunk, they walked on the outside. They walked with their child in the middle. The kids began to scream and cry because the child knows that's hot. You know how they drowned out the sound? The drums. They would boom, boom, beat the drum real loud so that the sound of the children crying would not be heard. And they did it for convenience. 98% of the children that are aborted in this country are aborted because the child is a nuisance. 98%. There are very few, if any, abortions for the health of the mother. For two reasons. Number one, women will make have children. Mm -hmm. Number two, if that's a problem, God knows how mm -hmm. to allow miscarriages. Yes. There are different things that you can do. But what about in the case of rape? One percent are in the case of rape. And spiritually speaking, as horrible as rape is, that's That's it, yeah. There are people in here who have been molested. Mm -hmm. That's horrible. Mm -hmm. 
It puts a scar in you. That in some cases, without the help of God, it won't go away. And sometimes people get saved and they still can't get past it. The, the scriptures closed on Tamar in her brother's house, depressed. Am I right about that? So she's with child because she was raped. The rapist took what he wanted. That's hard. But the solution, if the solution is abortion, then it puts you in a position to do to another human being something worse than what the rapist did to you. Because if you go through it, they're going to, see one thing abortion is not to do, they know how to count, and they have to count. You have to count fingers, toes, legs, you gotta make sure you get all the body parts. Mm -hmm. And they pull them out. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a horrible thing. It, but it's a horror that we need to talk about. It's hard to hear, but we need to talk about it. Because even though it's horrible, it goes on in our community alone at least 900 times a day. Did I tell you all 900 times a day? 900 times a day. So you ask yourself, as hard as that, as that rape was, you still got to live with pulling that child apart. And that, but that only account for one percent, if that, of all these things. Why am I parking it right here? This is a part of our doctrine, but we don't hear about it. Well, well, we don't. Except you hear preachers say. Well, what are you going to do? Abortion is not the only sin. It, it is if you're the one who's been aborted. <laughs> I've been trying to give away $10,000. I'm going to try it tonight. See if I get any takers. And I'll do it too. For those who say there are other issues, Here's the mic. Y'all got me? I got you. So if I get blown up, I'll get blown up with everybody living. I'll take a chance. Can somebody here tell me what government program, what government handout, what government college fund, what government job, what anything? gives any benefit, aid, comfort, or help to somebody who is not allowed to be born. Born. Let the record show nobody's moving. Let the record show. I know they may never get me back. So y'all been saying it's an unusual. <laughs> <laughs> you said unusual, right? Well, this is unusual. But you know what I'm hoping? I'm hoping it becomes usual. Because I, did, did I tell you that they're killing 900 of us every day like this? That's the problem. My portable's going out now. No takers. If you don't have life, you don't have anything. Any politician, this is a holy place. I feel the Holy Ghost. You can't have no politician come up in here in this holy place and stand in this holy place and tell you I support a woman's right to choose. Right. Mother, you know they don't. If, if, if they believe it, you ought to tell them, finish the sentence. I support a woman like you. Finish the sentence. You know why they don't finish the sentence? It's being tested. Well, it's been marketed 
If you finish your sentence, you won't say them. Right. Some of you are uncomfortable. God's forgiven you. I'm trying to save you next time. Right. But maybe somebody in prayer right now. <coughs> Let that baby live. Right. I was born out of here, God. My mama glad that she let me live. My mama, my mama had paid a, a house note, or bought a car, or paid a light bill, or, 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 or had the roof repaired, or had a central air put in, or bought tires, or, or made a car payment, or anything like that in 25 or 30 years. Because she let the baby live. She don't have to, because she's got me. Praise the Lord. So you don't know when you feel like you're solving your problem, you may be getting rid of the one that would be there. When that stroke that can't nobody foresee hits you later on, and everybody else is going, anybody got time for you? And there's the little illegitimate one, the Jephthah, yes. the one that they threw away, yes, that's the one that comes up there and says, I'll take care of you. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. But they can't do it if you give that child that's right. a death day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let the baby live. Yes, Church will forgive you. Matter of fact, put your arms around the person. Put your arms around them. And, and, and don't gossip so much because, see, some of us are saved, but the preacher said it tonight. Now, you know, we haven't we always been saved. Right. We haven't always been in these places that we're in now. I've been up before you too long. I said, Lord, when I get to this part in the doctrine, I might not finish the rest. He said, don't worry about it. Talk to him. We need preachers. Preachers, don't be a thin preacher. Thin preachers have mastered the art of saying nothing well. I don't think a preacher's preaching until he makes a lot of man. Jesus Read, read what happened when he went in the city. He left the place with the body. Folk wanted to fight. Those who believed truly believed. Those who didn't, didn't. And, you know, and eventually they killed him. So, hello. 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 I was at the clinic not long ago. A guy had a gun. And he said, I killed all y'all. I said, man, I'm already dead. <laughs> Crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Christ who made it in me. Our people deserve better. So the politician, if they finish the sentence, well, and, I'll, and I'll stop because I want to pray. The market said it won't sell. So they'll stand before you and say, I support a woman's right to choose. But they know if they say, I support a woman's right to choose to kill that baby that's in her womb. That won't fly. So they know how to stand up in front of you with the endorsement of the preacher. We don't have any discernment. We don't have any discernment. Discernment will tell you that person is wicked. You can't, you can't be holy and support a pop, those kinds of policies. You can't love us and support things that are killing us. My brother, what is your name? Michael Cameron. Michael Cameron. You're a cool brother. You're like a solid man to me. He got 12 When you sing a job, I didn't think you were. I respect you, you respect me. We, we have no fight. But I guarantee you this. No matter what I offered you, no matter how kind my words are, if I then tried to kill you, you wouldn't let that happen, would you? No, he no. wouldn't. <laughs> you, 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 you wouldn't believe I'm for you, would you? <laughs> he would not. You, you wouldn't believe that I love you, would you? You wouldn't support me, would you? 
No. Would you let me speak at your church? No. <laughs> Would you introduce me to your wife and your family? No, no. <laughs> Could I meet your daughter? No, you cannot. You don't play? None of the above. And yet we do it all the time. Tongue will talk. Spirit speak. Church of God and Christ speak. Uh, uh. I'm on this side of me. I hear you. As soon as services are, you'll make a beeline to the vision. Don't you ever bring that, <laughs> that man back. But I tell you what, though, if you follow me, my talk to his logical conclusion, little babies live. <laughs> I see you every week. Every week we got in the clinic. And I see little black girls, white girls too, but at the clinic, see, it's like a Tarzan movie at abortion clinics. Most of the people who are trying to save the babies are white. 90% of the people down there that kill their babies are black. And don't give me any, I don't want to hear anything about um, people struggling. They pull up in Lexus. My Lord. Mercedes Benz. My Lord. My Lord. Escalades. Yeah. Gucci bag. Nails. <laughs> Extensions. <laughs> oh. Yeah, bags. Louis. <laughs> and you're going in there. And sometimes they have a baby seat in the back. Mm. Little baby in the back. Mm. Going in there to kill its brother or sister. Uh -huh. The particular clinic where we fight at, when we first showed up seven years ago, 20, 30, 40 cars per Saturday. Just that one day. You couldn't, the parking lot jammed. Cars in the streets waiting to get in. Of room, Church of God in Christ showed up. And we start preaching. And we start praying. And mother, one Saturday, on, on, on certain Saturdays, our church mothers are down there. And when that little scared sister got out of her car and she's walking in there and she's contemplating that abortion, and across the street, she looks over there and she sees her mama. Mm. Saying, come here, baby. Come over here. Talk to us. We'll help you. I've seen them. I've seen them change their minds and go over there. Oh, we've had to contend with black men, brothers on the fight. But we get them to come over and we tell them, hey, man, I'm on your side. I'm not your enemy. Man up, go save your baby. When brother walked back in there, and the clinic people tried to stop him. He said, Get off of me. Got his girlfriend off that table. She laying there, they ready to perform the procedure. Oh and I saw the prettiest thing that I've ever seen. I saw the prettiest thing. And it, it gets me to this thing. That sister got up. She changed her mind, and as she walked out, because most of the people we never meet, we don't know her. We don't have to know her. You know what she gave me? She gave me a thumbs up. 